Cuba is three days into its national mourning period for former leader Fidel Castro, who, as you know, died Friday at the age of 90. Flags are at half staff, and early this morning, a 21-gun salute was fired off in his honor. Castro transferred power to his brother Raul in 2008, but his death marks an end of an era in Cuba where vigils have been held all over. He was not only an example to Cuba, he was an example to America Latina, and I believe that was an example to the entire world. For some Cuban exiles, particularly older ones here in the United States, it's a very different feeling, with celebrations in the streets and new hope for the country's future. It's a moment that we've been waiting for more than 55 years. We're free at last. This is a huge change for a community, and it, I think it, a lot of things, good things, are coming for us. Joining me now are Michelle Wojcik, owner of Galleria Cubano in Boston and Provincetown. She's also the former assistant director for the Cuba Project, the World Policy Institute in New York. Good to see you. Thank you. And Ambassador Paul Hare, who served as British ambassador to Cuba from 2001 to 04. He's now a senior lecturer in international relations at Boston University's Pardee School of Global Studies. Ambassador, it's good to see you too. So Justin Trudeau said, legendary revolutionary, significant improvement to education and health care. Donald Trump tweeted, brutal dictator who oppressed his own people. Who's closer to the truth, Michelle? Um, he's a controversial character, undoubtedly, but um, one cannot overlook his accomplishments of his own people, um, universal health care, uh, literacy campaigns that have produced uh, literacy rates higher than our own in the United States. Um, he's really fought a David and Goliath battle for, for 50 years against uh, the United States. It's but not it, it, much political freedom for his own people, correct? Yes, I would say certainly. You know, um, he he ruled undoubtedly with an iron fist at times, and um, I think at times more gentle than others. But uh, it's really his, his history is is complicated. Certainly, it, it's not only complicated. It's so different. In I mean, obviously the UK had relations with Cuba. The rest of the world saw him in a very different way than we saw him here. People mm -hmm. like Nelson Mandela saw him as a great supporter who led to freedom for his people in South Africa. Others saw him as somebody who had the, the, the David and Goliath thing. He got to stand up to us. How was he seen in the UK? He was seen as the complicated figure. <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously, he had 30 years of Soviet support. Uh, we were on the other side of the Cold mm. War, a Cuban Missile Crisis, of course. He used his funding to send his troops to Africa to train revolutionaries, to subvert, if you like, Western-style capitalism and democracy. Then, proving his versatility in the 90s, he had no Soviet support, so he turned to the EU and Canada for tourism, for foreign investment, and for new contacts. So we did a lot in my time there in promoting business. You, you had met him, correct? Yes, several times. Do, yes. Is there some piece of, I think we have a photo of that, by the way. <laughs> is there some piece of him that you recognize that we might not recognize in the man himself, or no? He's got different persona. I mean, everybody's familiar with his passionate eight-hour speeches. But in private, <laughs> in private, he, is, he devours the news. He would be watching you know, CNN and the like, which no Cuban can watch. He'd be reading the New York Times, which no Cuban can read. So he's interested in you know, world affairs. Speaking of no Cuban, do the Cuban people feel he's as complex? You've spent a lot of time there and gone mm -hmm. led uh, tours, uh, art and related mm -hmm. things. You've been there yourself a number of times. Did the Cuban people see him to be as complicated a figure as you two were describing? I think so. I do. Um, I hate to put words in, in their mouths. Um, but I, you know, it, I have a, for example, an artist that I've been working with for 10 years who's 63 years old now, and he says, if it weren't for the revolution, I wouldn't be an artist. I wouldn't be educated. I was a peasant farmer uh, from a family w without running water. You know, um, that being said, they also recognize that the revolution was not perfect um, and that... Uh, it's, well, it's they have more freedom now to voice an opinion, but they don't have a freedom to choose the leader. I mean, it is Raul Castro, mm -hmm. at least till 2018. Mm -hmm. And the Cuban people welcomed this normalization that was ushered in by Barack Obama. Did, did they not? Yeah, I think there were higher expectations, some of which mm -hmm. haven't been uh, realized. Like what? Like the ending of the embargo, for example? Or um, what? Some of them thought that. Uh -huh. Some of them thought that, um, yes, there would be more opportunities for freer media, They'd be able to earn their livings more, build their lives. There's still the average wage is $25 a month 
Who do they blame the for that? Uh, their own leader Well, generally, now, they have blamed the U.S. for the embargo, and that's the government propaganda line, is that, that the reason why we've had to sacrifice so much is because, because of... The, speaking of the U.S., mm -hmm. Donald Trump uh, recently said uh, they have to comply with, quote, our demands, whatever that means. This morning at 9.02, he mm -hmm. tweeted the following, if Cuba is unwilling to make a better deal for the Cuban people, the Cuban-American people, and the U.S. as a whole, I will terminate the... Deal. Does this mean a complete undoing of everything Barack Obama attempted to do in terms of our relations with Cuba? Is that your sense? Um, that's the implication. Um, I would hope that he doesn't go in that direction. I would hope that he understands what um, this kind of edu educational exchange has meant, what it's meant to both the Cuban people and the American people. He said he wanted in March, he was talking about when he was campaigning, he wanted to build a hotel there mm -hmm. when it was legal. Well, well so that philosophy said, sits oddly with his America first. Yeah. We want to do business, we want jobs. Because if he's going to say, we're not going to do business with you because of human rights, political, religious freedoms, then why is he going to do business with Russia, China, mm -hmm. other countries around Well, that's what we said about our relations with Cuba. 33 decades. governors exactly. are Republican who so, want to visit Cuba and do business. So do you mm -hmm. see Ambassador uh, Donald Trump doing, I wouldn't say a flip, but at least a modification of his position like he has on a number of issues in the past three weeks, or no? It's complicated. Mm -hmm. Is he going to sacrifice possible American business for sticking American noses once again into an adversarial relationship with Cuba? I would doubt it. The, the polls in Florida, which he won, not on the Cuba issue, two months ago, 67-70% of Cuban-Americans overwhelmingly support the Obama measures of sending remittances, of visiting as frequently as you like. So is he really going to overturn those? I doubt it. Michelle, nice to see you. Thanks for your insight. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Ambassador, pleasure. Thank you nice very much.